I'm recording this video in the morning before I have to go to my class, so I have 40 minutes to make it happen. And also, I have let my hair down for the first time in a while, so hopefully I don't see anything in post that makes me hate it. Let's do this video. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Serious Science Show channel and welcome to a new video. Welcome to my discussion video on Dear Martin. So if you follow me on Instagram, you've seen a behind the scenes highlights of this, but I basically recorded this video in its entirety last week. And then when I went to edit it, I figured out that it was very grainy and not usable. So here we are re-filming the video in a different day, in a different setting. Maybe it's a blessing in disguise, but anyway, let's talk. Oh, and before we get started, I also just have to say that I am wearing my People of Color shirt. This is a clothing line from a student on my campus who started it. I will leave the link to the website if anybody wants to buy a shirt. It's supporting local Oregonian businesses and they have really nice sayings on the back. I will insert a picture of the back of my shirt, but it says there's nothing minor about us and I just love this shirt, so please go check them out. So here it is. If you've never read Dear Martin, it's a book by Nick Stone and basically it follows our black teenager Justice. He is a student in high school and he's a well-achieving high grade level student and one day he is just trying to help his ex-girlfriend get home from a party when she's like drunk and inebriated and a cop rolls up on them and thinks that he is preying on this girl, I think her name is Mello, and he totally brutalizes Justice, throws him to the ground, puts him in handcuffs, won't listen to anything he says. And from this traumatizing experience, Justice starts writing letters to Martin Luther King, which is why it's called Dear Martin, and it's basically him just explaining to Dr. King the injustice that this one instance has woke him up to around, like, surrounding himself. Needless to say, this book is heavy and it deals with some heavy topics, so this discussion will be a little bit on the heavy side. I've got some coffee here and I've got my reading journal where I took my notes for this discussion, and basically I have broken down my discussion of Dear Martin into three different topics that I really wanted to talk about about. If you want any more of my opinions on Dear Martin, I did post a um, written review on my blog of the book that covers two different topics. So if you want to see other opinions on it, go read the review. It's just a book about a teenage black boy growing up in this world, being racially profiled, and trying to figure out how to manage it. So basically how I wanted to structure this review is that I wanted to present you all with a topic and then present you all with a quote where I think that topic was uh, came into play in the book, and then I wanted to explain any more further details, any personal relation to the topic or this particular quote, etc. So let's go into topic number one, which is internalized racism, and here's the quote that I want to talk about. this scene of the story is Manny is Justice's best friend and Justice and Manny are hanging out and they're just talking and Manny comes to this like real moment where he's like I need to tell you something it's kind of like a moment of confidence in Justice and he basically says that I am afraid of black girls because they're attitude and ghetto and I've only ever known black women to be my cousins who exhibit those behaviors. So it feels odd looking for a formal definition of internalized racism just because this is something that looks different on everybody who experiences experiences it, but in my research I did come across a definition that I think is really um, fitting for this topic or at least this quote, and I'm going to read it from it straight from my reading journal, I wrote it down. This is from Donna K. Bivens from racialequitytools.org, and she defines internalized racism as the development of ideas, beliefs, actions, and behaviors that support or collude with racism. So in applying this definition to the quote that I have presented, I wanted to really focus on the action words that Donna K. Bivens provides in this definition. So what I wrote down is that like there is a belief that leads you to an action and that that action supports or colludes with racism. So those are the three action words of the definition given. So using those action words in the definition, I applied it to the quote that I have given by saying that Manny holds a belief that black girls are attitude and ghetto. He acts to avoid them or be afraid of them, but he supports and colludes with racism in this particular example because he acknowledges that that is wrong and that is a stereotype, but he does nothing to fix his mindset or change the behavior of avoidance. 
I was reading about internalized racism from this particular source and this particular author, I came across this part of the literature that was really interesting to me, but I actually really identify with it and I think that is valuable, at least in some ways. Basically, Donna positions internalized racism as a symptom of a bigger problem. She says that all the things that come along with racism, including like self-hate or self-deprivation or just like stereotypes or just like looking down on a person of a certain race, is all symptoms symptoms of the bigger problem of systemic racism in our society. I think there is value in positioning these symptoms of like colorism or self-hate or just self-deprecation or stereotypes as symptoms of a bigger problem because it kind of forces you to think bigger than just the situation at hand. It promotes you to think about the system at play that's causing these issues rather than just like, oh, this is what's happening. And that kind of leads me to a little bit of criticism I had of this scene of Dear Martin. So basically, like I said, this was like a moment of confidence for Manny, but there's not much attention given to the fact that he says this. It kind of just gets brushed off as a joke afterwards and the scene moves on. And I just really wish there was more attention given to why Manny feels this way and kind of like maybe character dialogue between Manny and Justice where Justice is like, hey, that's not okay. Let's figure this out. Like, why do you feel that way about black women? Because that's not okay. Um, but instead it was kind of just like thrown into the void or like shouted into the void by this character and then nothing comes of it. And I really wish, like, I think that was a missed opportunity to kind of explore the feelings of internalized racism and the like drivers of those feelings. Um, so that's just something that I had like a little bit of an issue with. But then again, this could be a classic example of like, let me give you the thought, but you have to explore it kind of thing. But with all that said, that leads me to my next point, topic number two, and that is, is black classism slash the concept of being a race traitor. So this particular quote appears right after Justice is brutalized by the cop after trying to help Mel get back to her house and this is like his first letter to Martin and he's just kind of exploring the fact that he has had some very like unrealistic mindset about himself and his position in the world. So what I had written down in my reading journal for this particular point of the book is that I just really appreciated the thorough discussion of Justice exploring this like ill-represented or just like misconstrued version of the world and his position in it and his mind after this event because these are kind of feelings that I feel like somebody would be ashamed to admit and Justice wasn't some like like I am totally perfect kind of character because nobody is and everybody has these like feelings and like implicit prejudices no matter how much we want to pretend like we don't. So what I had written down is that Justice kind of segregates himself in a me versus them mindset. So he's saying that if I act as a like upstanding member of society and as a black man then I will not experience these kind of racially charged events. I will be exempt from racism because I am a good person, a good brown person, a good black person. And in that thinking on the other side of the coin, he is also kind of saying, hey, I don't deserve this because I am a good person, I am a good black man. Those other black people, however, they do because their actions warrant police brutality. So this kind of brings me to the point of the concept of a race traitor because when you think of classism you typically think of somebody of a higher social class looking down at somebody that's of a lower social class. But there was an interesting situation and dialogue that happened between two characters, two black characters of this book and I wanted to talk about that. So let's talk about the concept of being a race traitor. So there was no formal definition that I could find of a being a race traitor but off of just the internet, I got the definition that a race traitor is someone who has turned against their race slash ethnicity in favor of those who would persecute them. Without explaining the entire relationship background of Justice and this other character, basically there's just an exchange at a party and that's where this quote comes from. And I just wanted to talk about this because it's an interesting positioning of um, classism. I hesitate to kind of position this as a reverse classism because I'm not sure such a thing exists. But basically what I'm getting at is that from this character interaction, you can kind of see that the character that says this dialogue is almost position positioning himself as lower in class compared to Justice because he is saying that 
justice has to stick with white people to make it to the top. And if justice is sticking with white people to make it to the top, that means that this character is just, by logic, below justice. In this dialogue, he's basically telling justice, like, if you didn't hang out with white people, you would be down here with me. It was just a very startling interaction to read, and it was startling for justice, and he kind of talks about afterwards how he was like, ooh, why is it that, like, me trying to better myself makes me a race traitor to these guys? But also it was just startling for me as a reader because these are things that I have experienced in my own personal life. Like I have been accused of the concept of being a race traitor because I have a lot of like white people in my life. And um, it's just a weird and rampant concept within the black community that like if you hang out with white people or you associate with more white people than black people, you are somehow less black than you, and you are more white because you hang out with white people. And it's just like one of those things that it's like, you kind of grow up and you're socialized to believe that. There's probably a lot of underlying psychology to why this kind of mindset exists in black communities and maybe in other racial communities that I'm not aware of, but in my own personal experience, it is rampant. It is like something that you grow up with or at least something that I grew up with as a black kid. And it's just like, it's an icky feeling. It's an icky feeling because you are made to feel, like I said, ashamed for being associated with more white people or whatever, because like black people kind of disown you or you feel disowned by black communities or you don't fit in with black communities because you don't, you know, you're not fully black or like you're a traitor. Like it's just a weird concept that made me as a kid growing up feel very like ashamed of myself. And I really hope that talking about this is something, like I'm not the only one or I'm just not crazy and I'm not making this up because I don't know, it's just something that I grew up with and yeah, that's just all I can say about it. It's just icky. Sorry for any like changes in scenery or whatever, but my camera is telling me that it's hot and I have 20 minutes until my class, so I need to wrap this up. But that leads me to my last and final topic of this Dear Martin discussion video and that is the topic of interracial relationships. So I'm not even gonna lie to you all, I started making these review notes right after I finished the book like two weeks ago and I actually never finished making my review notes for this particular topic. So we're gonna go off the cuff here. <laughs> I am not going to expose my entire life on the internet because there are some things that need to be kept private. However, I am in an interracial relationship. My boyfriend is white. If you have watched my like plan with me from back in the summer when we um, broke distance for long distance, um, we've been together forever basically, but it's an interracial relationship. And there was a really interesting and icky, uh, if I must say, um, interaction between Justice and his mom about the concept of Justice dating his debate partner, SJ. SJ is white. She's not white, she's Jewish, but to Justice's mom, she is white. And Justice's mom literally tells him so many times out of the book, you will not date a white girl. You better not come home with a white girl. I will not give you my blessing if you date a white girl. And <laughs> that just like, that was a really uncomfortable moment for me as a black person being in an interracial relationship with a white person. It's one of those topics that I feel like it's very easy to be like, oh yes, I am all for racial mixing. And then behind closed doors, you have other opinions that say otherwise. And that is very much the dynamic that we see between Justice and his mom. Justice's mom is all friendly with SJ, always welcoming, but behind closed doors, Justice's mom is like, you better not bring that white girl home because I will not give you my blessing. I do not condone. And you know, I don't want to like sit here and be like, ah, oh, my life and this person or whatever, but I'm just saying like, this is something that I have experienced from people that were in my life at one point and are not anymore. And um, it's just an icky, icky feeling. And again, I am no social psychologist. I am no sociologist. I don't know the psychology behind how these mindsets like come up in a culture or in a race or whatever. But I'm just like, it's an interesting thing because it's one of those things where I feel like some people genuinely think it's okay and other people don't. So let me give you an example. If it's okay for a black mom to say this to a black child, would it be okay for a white mom to say this to a white child? Would you have the same reaction to like Justice's mom saying he can't date a white girl as you would to a white mom saying to her white son, you cannot date a black girl? 
personally, I think the people would have a very different reaction. Um, but what I want to boil this down to and end this off with is the fact that it does not matter at the end of the day whether it came from a white mom to a white child or a black mom to a black child. The thing that underlines both of those scenarios is that the child in the middle is experiencing the same kind of shame and just uncertainty of whether their parent will support them. And at the end of the day, both children experiencing this is wrong and it should not be something that we think is okay in some situations and isn't okay in others. Just speaking from somebody again that is in an interracial relationship, this is just something that hit very close to home for me and it was very icky to read. And I just know that my child, no matter who I end up with, if it's an interracial child or not, I'm going to love that child and love anybody that they bring home because everybody deserves to love who they want to love. And with all of that being said, that leads me to the end of my Dear Martin discussion video. Thank you all so much for watching. Please let me know any kind of comments that you have on any of the topics that I have presented today. Please keep my comment section civil if you are going to have a discourse because we're here to talk about it and learn and not attack. That's not the type of energy we exude on, that cha on this channel. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all on the channel next Sunday. Bye everybody.